what I will say to begin is that awareness is the key precisely because, for instance, I went off and prepared a whole long section on censorship resistance for our talk today, and now we'll probably not say a word about it. <laughs> uh, and this for me is another fantastic and in the moment example of what it means to learn, right? Uh, to see your own proclivities, habits, tendencies, biases, uh, to look as clearly into the mirror that is provided by your environment and those that are around you and to genuinely be available to respond as it arises uh, is um, a skill and a discipline which can be cultivated. It can be grown in the same way that a garden is. And it is, for me, at the heart of what I've come to understand about learning. So as a kid, I read enormously. I've always loved to read. Um, I read fantasy mostly uh, and would walk around prep school, uh, sort of buried in books. Um, but also, you know, I wasn't completely a nerd. <laughs> I, I, I was this and many other things. The, the large majority when I wasn't reading, I was swimming. Uh, these two things have informed a lot of how I think about life, uh, precisely because so much of what genuine learning is about is balance and embodiment. Right? There are different kinds of knowledge that we can explore. The one for sure is called sort of propositional knowledge in one way of speaking about it, which is the knowledge to be gained from reading, from understanding concepts, from the intellectual explorations of which our minds are capable of and which are truly miraculous. Uh, but then there are other kinds of knowledge. There's sort of perspectival and procedural and participatory kinds of knowledge. Uh, and a huge amount of my time was spent swimming. Uh, I was a competitive swimmer and the lessons that this taught me, particularly I think in terms of focus and flow uh, have really stayed with me uh, right up until the present day. We did these, um, my coach got a sports psychologist in when I was a young kid and they taught us a number of things, the most important and beneficial of which in the long run has turned out to be this process of visualizing a race before it happened. Uh, and in fine detail, you would sit quietly uh, in the room before a national final or something and visualize every step, you know, sort of lining up, getting your name called, going to sit in the chair, putting on your goggles, tying your costume, walking across the pool deck, getting onto the block, the three whistles, the one whistle to get ready, the starter's voice, take your marks, the beep, the whole thing, what it would feel like to dive into the water. You'd, you'd visualize the entire thing so that when it actually happened in reality, uh, the inevitable nerves and anxiety that would arise out of these race conditions uh, were somehow familiar and could be channeled into constructive and creative uses. So it wasn't that this particular method got you uh, to be less nervous. It's just that the nerves and the anxiety were more familiar and you could use them rather than be overwhelmed by them. Uh, and I feel that this you know, has played a large role in the learning of all these different kinds of knowledge as my life has unfolded, that um, the ability to sit, examine, and reflect uh, increasingly in the moment as things occur adds an element of uh, familiarity to the deep strangeness of reality that reality will always be strange and unknowable. And yet the embodied and participatory understanding of that allows one to hone and fine tune uh, the capacity to respond in increasingly honest, open, transparent, responsible and accountable ways. Uh, as this happens, you come to see that in fact, it's really extraordinarily simple. Um, 
I, it's funny, it's got absolutely nothing to do with your question, but I will go on a slight tangent now because one of my great loves in this life is telling stories because I think that that's primarily how we learn. We are a social narrative species and traditionally knowledge has always been passed out through stories, but I have a random one, which is that, uh, you know, so much of Kernel is based on this uh, video which was made by a friend of mine at university uh, in my undergrad where she interviewed Paul Nyberg and he speaks at length about conversation and it informs so much of the kernel syllabus it's there in module zero and is really one of the critical seeds around which all of this crystallized and yesterday <laughs> literally it's raining in Cape Town I've been here since Monday before last and it has rained solidly for two weeks and it's raining right now uh, and there was a brief gap in the weather. Uh, myself and Anna decided to make the most of it and go to a beach. As we got near the beach, it started raining again, but there was this huge rainbow over the side of the mountain here in Cape Town. And we decided, okay, we'll follow that and go towards a different place that I happen to know, a tiny little coffee shop hidden from everywhere that I once found when I was hopelessly lost, uh, and which sells incredibly good coffee. And I thought, well, you know, we're out and we're exploring, why not go and, and find it? And we walked into this coffee shop and it's literally, it's the most hidden coffee shop in the world. I can't tell you how small and niche this place is. And I swear to God, the barista was Paul Myberg. <laughs> he was standing there, so Paul Myberg made me an, uh, a coffee yesterday. And yes, he does make incredible coffee. Um, <laughs> and the funniest thing happened was I, I had a, uh, we've been traveling around the country, I have some, crystals that I found in one particular place when we were mountain climbing. And uh, I gave him one of these crystals. Uh, and he looked at me, he said at one stage, he said, you know, thank you, but there's sort of, there's nothing mystical necessarily about this rock. Reality is enough. Uh, and I thought that that was such a profound insight uh, to share. Um, and it leads me back to what I came to in that learn post was it's just about awareness is that if you're simply present and totally aware with whatever is happening at any given moment you will know that reality is enough <laughs> you don't need to add any of your own strangenesses projections interpretations habituations all of these things can be let go because what reality is is enough uh, and then he handed me a coffee and off I went. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he sent me a Slack message. <laughs> Said, hey, I just got a coffee from Paul Myberg. <laughs> sent him five dots. I was like, that, 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 that. It was like a big question mark. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then we had a nice conversation about it after. It's insane. And the way that Paul is living his life and the fact that he makes good coffee, I think is a very important part of that particular. Well, this is, right? yeah, the other thing that he shared, and I think that it's particularly relevant to this notion of what does it mean to learn how to learn? You know, I, at one stage I couldn't resist, but ask him, you know, Paul, what are you doing here? Why this particular coffee shop in a random little town just outside of Cape Town on a rainy, weekday and first of all he said well look I just got back from Limpopo where I was tracking buffalo and I was like yes that checks out that totally makes sense uh but you know he said well it doesn't actually matter what you do what you do is of literally no consequence what matters is how you are when you're doing it and how you do it uh and I think this particularly profound insight in terms of learning right is that it may seem, yes, that some jobs are more important than others, that some people are more important than others, but this is transient and inconsequential. In, you know, <laughs> where is the CEO when they're in the grave? It does not matter. Your resume is inconsequential. It's the epigraph that counts, right? And I think that to stand there in this tiny little coffee shop and see him making coffee and say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. It's of no consequence. What matters is how you are when you're doing it is a particularly profound insight into how you can bring yourself to places where you learn much more easily in a much more long-term way 
and with much greater impacts in your own life and the lives of those around you is by literally always asking, how am I, as I'm learning about this, why am I doing this? You know, is it because I want to appear as important? Is it because I want to fit in? Is it because this is what the prevailing cultural conditions have set as a preconceived notion in my mind of what is important, valuable, meaningful? Is it because I have some kind of notion of what it means to make a contribution to society or any of these things? And to have the courage to step away from that for a moment and ask, how am I? You know, like, what is, what is the quality of my total being in this moment? Am I on fire? Am I burning with passion? Am I in love with what I do and with who I am as I'm doing it? And if not, move on. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's almost an impossible thing to ask, I know, but it has been, as far as is possible, the measure by which I've tried to live my life. I do the things that I love, and then learning is not even something that I consider, because in some very real sense, although it's not possible to speak about these things universally, perhaps, in some very real sense, I think what it means to be human being is to be a learning moral creature. Right, that these are the two foundational aspects of our existence in duality is to be both moral and to have the ability to learn. Uh, and so when we are doing who we are, <laughs> then learning is the natural result of that without any kind of extra efforts. I want to come back to that idea in the word awareness uh, as it relates to that quality of feeling Alan what's the quote that's in my mind what you do doesn't matter what matters is how you are when you are doing it so perhaps we'll get back to that with awareness and what I really loved from this module was duende um, which gets us even further away from censorship resistance but I do want to give you a chance to get into that to the degree you're willing to go back to dive in on this uncensored learning question. And most specifically, how can Web3 impact our ability to um, to make this concept whole? Like, what is this idea of uncensored learning as the starting point? And then what does that look like in the context of scaling principled games, which is the overall thesis of this module. Well, the part that we've covered perhaps already is that the being the one responsible for most often censoring what we learn is ourself, right? Uh, we are our own harshest critics almost always, and it is almost directly as a result of our own preconceived notions of what it means to be good, what it means to be skilled, what it means to be a meaningful, worthwhile, worthy contributor, which prevents us from truly learning the things that we are passionate about. Uh, if you can get past that obstacle, you know, uh, there's a line in the Quran which says, and what will make you know what this obstacle is? You know, I mean, incredible. The, the self is the greatest obstacle towards these kinds of things. If you can get past that, then there are also inevitably and simultaneous to it many uh, both cultural, but also like political and just social facts of reality that have a huge impact on the kinds of knowledge that are made available and the kinds of people to whom that knowledge is made available, right? One of the things which I have always said extensively is that first of all when people say you know blockchain is really complicated it's so difficult to learn about uh it's never going to sort of uh go mainstream <laughs> so just what is your time horizon on this right because the core difference although i happen to think that the current financial system is more complicated than blockchain but that's just because i have a particular kind of education and background that allows me to understand some of the technical details which might and in fact, very much is not available to most of the people who are uh, in my immediate environment and who have surrounded me always. Uh, 
uh, in South Africa, Southern Africa, and Africa in general. Uh, you know, it's very deeply understandable in my lived experience, you know, how difficult it is to understand this stuff. But the difference is that the knowledge required to come to some kind of fundamental understanding of how these systems work is accessible. Uh, whereas to understand how the current financial system works, one needs to have a certain kind of educational level that allows you to get a job at a bank, that allows you to get a job in a stockbroker or some other kind of financial intermediary and thereby learn uh, how these things fit together, or at least some small part of them, never the entire system. Um, and, you know, in that particular fashion, I think that's like one of the deeper and more important aspects of the censorship resistance parts of the technology, which also applies to who is allowed to learn about these things and where is that learning taking place, uh, is the point that's made in that post that, you know, when you merge money and speech to the extent that these kind of econolinguistic networks have, uh, expression and economic action occur simultaneously. And often when I make that kind of point, you know, the natural res response to it is, well, that's not necessarily a good thing because it doesn't mean that only the rich get to speak meaningfully. It's not necessarily a good thing that all of this knowledge is freely accessible and open source because only the educated can truly understand it. And I think that this is true, but what it points to is that this is exactly the work that we have to do, right? It's exactly what creative and adaptively programmed incentives are about, which is redefining wealth. You know, if you think that wealth is some kind of number, singular rep representation, then you will never have enough. Uh, but if wealth is who and what you already are, when doing especially things that make you passionate and in love, then it's something utterly different, right? And uh, the very concrete example that I have of this kind of thing is, you know, I wrote a curation curve for DAPS, which is a very, very basic example of the kind of creative use of mathematical structure to curate information in a way which provably benefits the community who views it, while also accounting for the inevitable inequality which arises out of society as it exists at the moment. Right? So we use a particular curve a mathematical structure to ensure that the more people have paid to rank Heidi, the easier it is to influence that ranking. So a very, very basic example of the kind of incentive structures that we can build, which allow for, in a censorship resistant way, more people to play these principal kinds of games. It's not perfect, right? But what it does do is account for the unequal reality and society within which we exist and implement the kind of meta game that Sam spoke about in that our weave talk, which progressively and iteratively incentivizes pro-social results. Um, I think that what I'm trying to point at here is that the code in and of itself is not going to uh, necessarily make for a more equitable society in which uncensored learning can genuinely take place. But the creative and adaptive use of the kinds of incentive structures that we can begin to encode here will help us uh, move along that path. And the reason for that is because it's not any more about ideological posturing, right? But it's rather about building these clear and complete threat models which provides some kind of shared ground on which to create these genuine commons. Because instead of sort of using legal, co legal code to uphold like a supposed good, say, free speech, we can use economic code to make censorship prohibitively expensive. And the main point that I want to make is this, right? Because this thing of, but instead of just setting aside for a moment the notion that we should use legal code uh, to try and protect free speech and instead looking at how we can use economic code to make censorship pro prohibitively expensive goes right into the heart of why quantum thinking is so powerful. And this 
thing about why, <laughs> why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we all here speaking about this kind of stuff, working on these things is at the heart of module six and we can come to it with Duende. But here is illustrated like the greatest, I think, power of this particular pattern of thoughts, which is that like, we can see that the goal is as it always has been, right? To protect some kind of coherence and constructive way of living together. But when you use legal code to enforce that, the language itself gives it away, right? Because you're, <laughs> you're trying to protect a way of living together with a system premised on the threat of violence, of enforcement, right? And you can see this kind of pattern come through in Lao Tzu's thinking and any kind of Zen or like Eastern wisdom holds it, right? It's our desire to secure, which is precisely what informs our insecurity or it's our desire to protect, which is exactly what informs violence. As soon as you want to protect something, force is the ne necessary complementary opposite that arises with it. They're mutually interdependent, right? And it goes back to Lao Tzu's insight that whomever defends with love, they are secure. Why? Why, why does he say that, right? It's because love does not exclude, love embraces, it integrates, it unifies. And so when our method is to protect, then it necessitates this force on the other end of the spectrum. And the end result in the middle is exclusion of any number of kinds, right? But if instead our method is to sort of promote genuinely free access on the one side and penalize provably malicious behavior on the other side, based on these encoded notions of what it means to cheat, then, you know, we can come to like a protected way of living together in a coherent and creative manner without ever defining exactly what that way is, because as soon as you define it, you exclude. And that to me is something that's really, really fascinating and kind of undervalued about this way of thinking, right? Is that like, we know what the end goal is, which is to protect some kind of creative way of living together. But the problem has always been that as soon as you define what that is in language, you exclude, right? And so instead, if you can work on either side of the spectrum and say we promote completely free access, both to knowledge and the network about which that knowledge operates, uh, and we can penalize in objective, measurable, and definable, encodable, executable ways, behavior which is not in line with the principles of the network, then you can come to the middle ground, which is this like inherently creative and coherent way of being together without ever actually saying exactly what that is. And getting people to accept <laughs> that that is like a coherent and good way of thinking about it is quite difficult because we're so used to like, yes, this is the definition of the thing. This is exactly how it is. And unless it's legible and directly described and completely rational that I can totally wrap my mind around it, I, I cannot accept it. But what this is asking for is exactly that, that we find these adaptive incentivized ways of both promoting what we know to be good while penalizing that which is provably malicious in context, uh, such that we can come to love's defense. It's um, a lot to take in, and I want to open it up for anyone who would like to unmute if anyone has thoughts, questions. Uh, and, and just for my side, I think this is why this module and the next one become so important to me, is that they're not so easily described in words like a DAO or an NFT. It has more to do with the quality with which we engage in those environments and the incentives that we set up within those structures that usually are highly, highly uh, situational and require the first question to be, how do I feel when I'm providing this particular avenue for exploration? Um, so open to any other thoughts or questions, considerations on this topic. Uh, 
I've got a question for you, Andy. Um, and I think it's, it kind of drives that attention that I feel and a lot of us feel. So this don't fight the system, just abandon it. I, I, I can relate to that impulse and like, there's definitely a, a maybe a repressed streak of the crypto anarchist in me. And I, I definitely feel a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, resentment to, towards what I see as like pretty unjust systems that are being perpetuated around the world. And, but then like a much bigger part of me says, hold on, like we need to, we need to put a hand out, like we need to include, we can't just run away, right? Like the world is not, you know, it's still going to be there and it's still going to be kind of like machining on. Um, so how do you reconcile that tension or I guess, yeah, how do you think about that? How do you think about if, if we just leave then in a way it almost just concentrates the, the injustice? Um, yeah, I, I can ask maybe more questions, but I'm curious on that one. Yeah, it's a good question. And the honest response, of course, is that this particular slogan, and that's what it is, uh, comes from a very privileged position, right? of course. <laughs> just, uh, you're, uh, I am an, a person who is in a position where I can say just abandon the system. Uh, and what I really mean by it is something much deeper than that. And it goes back to this notion of awareness, right? And attention, like where you put your own energy and attention. I am not suggesting by this that you should never, that you should not speak truth to power, that you should not speak out against injustice, uh, that it is not incumbent upon each and every one of us to be deeply aware, not just of our rights, right? But of our responsibilities, both to ourselves and to one another, to the communities in which we are embedded, which include both digital and physical. It's not actually possible when you think about it, and this is the tension that you're pointing to, to abandon the system. Right? And, and, and that's why I love this particular phrase because it drives you into, again, this freedom of no escape, right? But there is freedom in not being able to escape. What is that freedom? Why do we care about it? And the freedom, again, is primarily this ability of our own to respond, the choice that we are given to respond in every single moment and respond about where it is that we put our awareness. Is one's awareness focused on the system which is unjust, unbalanced, unequal? Or is one's awareness on what are the creative ways in which I can respond to this? And I think that that is really what is being asked by this kind of thing of like, don't, don't fight the system, don't react against what is inevitably going to be unjust and unequal, because that is the game in which we are embedded, that is the nature of the world, in fact, is like, if you look again, like, because I've been drawing on some of the Eastern traditions, uh, you know, like the world is suffering, right? This is not a pejorative statement or like a moral claim. It's just an observation that is Buddhism's great gift to the world is it's observational, right? It's, it's experimentation and observation. And you see it wherever you look, right? Uh, and the, the only question then is not like, oh, why suffering? Right? That comes later on. But the first and most important thing is like, how do I respond? Right? Do I just react and, and inevitably kick back the system which kicks me, but in like ultimately like an inconsequential way? Uh, or, you know, do I find some creative means around it? And this is really what I mean by like abandon, abandon that, like abandon the sense within yourself of being a repressed anarchist, right? And the, the, there is a very important way in which 
through following your passion, through doing what you love, whatever that is, you can find the most creatively free ways of being within a system that is unjust. And it turns out just by historical observation that those who are capable of living on their own terms in these kinds of creative ways, which are still inevitably entangled and embedded within the system, and yet don't respond to it in traditional and default kinds of ways, are the people who have the greatest impact on like the inevitable sort of changing of the guard every time it happens as we evolve from paradigm to paradigm to paradigm. It's, you know, it's the same thing. Like in the heart sutra, you'll see like emptiness is form, form is emptiness. It doesn't mean everything is meaningless, right? right? Emptiness is not meaninglessness. Detachment is not disinterest. There are very, these, these words, empty, detached, abandoned, are not, not negative, right? Uh, they simply hold the space for some kind of genuinely creative response, which is not conditioned by like my own personality and proclivities to come through. And that's what I'm interested in. I, you know, I understand that on the surface, it is a very, very privileged thing to say, and I own that. Um, but my particular interest in it is not like what it means on the surface, because I think that it's obvious that you cannot abandon the system uh, and that it forces this kind of deeper inquiry into like, okay, like, what am I actually abandoning? Uh, I want to see if Sparrow would like to add any thoughts there. Sparrow had raised your hand a bit earlier. If anyone else would like to add anything, you know, um, I think it's I think it's interesting what Andy's saying. I think it's it's I think it also brings up how. Uh, talk about the system and transcending the system or changing the system, but I think it also brings up the idea, idea of how does the system or even reality itself exist? Like, were we born into uh, into a materially created thing that has absolute existence or eternalist existence or materialist existence? Or are we participating in our experience in some way? Are we responsible for the system in some way? That might be, you know, not necessarily obvious to us. Always both. That's uh, my answer to these things. The, yes, you are responsible. Yes, you had nothing to do with your own birth. Find a way of integrating that in your own experience and you live a truly creative and free life. Go ahead, Sparrow, if you're there. Yeah. Um, so first I'll say I, I completely agree with everything Vivek said in his introduction. I, I find Andy's talks to be incredibly insightful and relaxing in a way that many things in this world are, are not. <laughs> And so I appreciate having this hour out of my busy schedule to, to actually just sit and absorb this information. Um, so thank you both. Thank you, Andy, for being such an inspiring person. Um, the thing that really struck me, the, the, the quote about reality is enough, I think, really resonates with me as an artist because everything that I do as art is in response to things that I experience in the world. And so there's some thread there. There's some conversation between reality and our being that produces art for me. Um, but I wondered how you thought about, or if you can talk a bit about the uneasy 
alignment of reality is enough and we are beings formed and based on stories which are often not quote unquote realistic and how those two intention open up possibilities. Uh, an amazing question. Thank you, Svera. Uh, and thank you for your continued participation. It's truly a privilege to have you uh, as a part of this community. It's been so wonderful uh, getting to know you over many of these blocks and in between. I, I don't have as coherent a response for this particular question uh, as for some others. And in some sense, it's because uh, there is, as you say, this deep tension in the inner knowing that who I am and what I am is enough and my experience of the world, which is that nothing is ever enough. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> how much recognition I get, how much money you make, how many wonderful things you produce, what kinds of art you, there's always more to be done. Like there's always, it can always be done better. It can always, there's always room for improvement. You look back on all of the past versions of yourself and there's, you know, I mean, if you're not bewildered by all of the idiots that you've been, I don't know. I, I don't know if we can be friends because I'm constantly bewildered by, you know, all of these fools <laughs> that I've been in every previous day of my life. Um, and I think that that, you know, like, again, it, it, it drives at least me, right. to the, a deeper and deeper reflection on, about like what love really is. Like, because like, it's in, my own work and particularly in my own art, uh, which for me comes in the form of writing. It's about, <laughs> you know, how can I, like, like what, what is the possibility space for how many different ways I can figure out, you know, to love all of my flaws? Because that's the deepest kind of love. The, the, the foundational thing here is unconditional love, right? And the way in which we are driven to an embodied experience that is participatory, perspectival, procedural, and uh, you know, propositional, all of these knowledges combined of what unconditional love is, is precisely by seeing clearly all of the flaws uh, and loving them. Um, because when love meets limitation, that's when you get the embodied experience of oneness or infinity because they're the same thing at that point uh, and yeah yeah i think that the the possibilities for my own idiocy and for the unconditional love that meets it are infinite <laughs> and that to me is like one of the ultimate miracles uh, something truly to be celebrated and something for which there is no end to the gratitude that you can feel Thank you, thank you, Sparrow, for your question. And um, I think Alon, uh, him and Ellen have been wonderful parts of many blocks at this point. And a question or a thought. Thank you. Um, Andy, you said it so eloquently about when we are doing what we are, then learning happens and so much more. I think we find ourselves, and this is just, first of all, this is beautiful. Um, and. Very insightful. And I, I wanted to reflect on that via kernel in this community. And I think that when you do that, we can see it through this community that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your origins are, who you are, what you do, what is your initial state. When you connect that point, then we are all the same. We understand the same, we see the same, and we're able to uh, evolve. I would say also. And I think this this cohort and, and this community examples that perfectly. And I would kind of wrap with the question, how how would you share this also outside? I think 
by joining this program and, and all of us have some kind of initial thoughts about what we're looking for or where we want to look for but not everybody is are there so how, how would you start sharing this with somebody who is not yet he's at the beginning of his journey thank you so much alan it's, you know to have the colonel family there in israel is really a wonderful thing for us and we look forward to many wonderful family gatherings. Uh, it's, I would say two things that I think that the simple answer to this is responsibility, right? What we've been kind of talking about today. That's um, the classic kind of, because I've been with the Buddhists today, the classic response uh, Buddha gets, gets asked, uh, you know, you've taught us about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and it's all wonderful. How, do, how are we going to use this stuff to change the world? You know, it's the prototypical management consultancy uh, prior to the development of the Western world. And uh, his response is very simple. He says that reality can be imagined or described as this vast net. It's called Indra's web. Every being, every conscious being is its own center of light in this web, reflects all others, but never obscures another, every one its own center. And what you're asking is like how do we lift the web <laughs> which is not possible there's nothing to stand on beneath the web no strength that could ever lift it the web is the whole of reality so the only thing that one can do is lift oneself and that causes ripples of lights throughout the web but in a way that you cannot control or predict hence the humility uh, sort of spoken about earlier on and um, so how do you how do you share it well you you respond honestly and with the greatest degree of presence you can to the situation of your own life. Uh, nothing more and nothing less than that. Um, and I have a, a very great friend of mine who is a Zen teacher uh, in the Karoo, which is this beautiful empty place in the middle of South Africa. It's the perfect place to learn Zen. They turned the cow shed into a meditation chamber, him and his wife. And, you can now go and sit there and uh, just hang out with them. And they have a little bowl that they hit, and then you sit. And then a little time later, they hit the ball again, and you bow and leave. And that's kind of what you do. He wrote a book once, though, and he said that without my own doing anything in particular, a transmission of the light is already passing from heart to heart, all the way from here to Cape Town. Uh, which I thought was so beautiful. That's uh, so much of what really matters is not within our control, although we have responsibility for embodying it, and that is all. Uh, and so, you know, there's no particular uh, thing to pass on. What is asked in some sense, what the invitation is in some sense, in all of this stuff, not just in kernel, but in things which you find to be truly meaningful and which give life purpose, the invitation is always to clear the heart so that what is can shine. Right? Uh, yeah, till that final moment where we find ourselves enveloped by light and shining. Uh, this is a line that I always loved. Uh, because it speaks to what is right this radiance which is all around us all of the time and yet which must still be shone from the purified heart and that particular paradox is a fascinating one i wanted to speak to this i mean sometimes i wonder in these discussions you know are we taking it too far are we not focused enough on the particulars of how we can take DAOs forward or NFTs forward. And um, and I hear those things in my head as we go through these firesides and happen today. Um, but what Andy just said, I mean, it just reminded me of, of how excited I am for Brit to be joining next week, because ultimately a lot of the feelings that I think we've tried our best to recreate come from an environment that he shared beyond any particular words. And the environment was very different. <laughs> it was in a small town in Texas with a 
very different group of people that was mostly focused on finance and only at some deeper level uh, connects to some of the things that, that now we are hoping to pass on. And so hearing from Brit is, is just such an interesting historical context for Colonel, in my view, partially, hopefully illuminating to how we hope this goes next, which is that in the projects that you build and the things that you do that are slightly more practical than perhaps this discussion, that if anything touches, that that, that goes on. But we understand and hope that the context continues to shift based on the particulars of what makes sense uh, and that fit the things that, that fit for you, basically. Um, thank you, Alon. I think we have a couple of more, um, let's see, we have Ellen, if she doesn't mind, and then Mike and Paul are also there. Ellen, please, please. Uh, Good now. I, I'm sorry that I'm uh, answering uh, Alon's question. With oh, yeah. he, he's here with me in the room. Uh, but I think that each of us can influence our environment by just a bit. Each project that does something good that can express something more good into this world uh, progresses the, the world. So this is what we can do, each of us, every bit. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And everyone always loves the quote in the background. <laughs> it's perfect for what you just said. So. Cool. Um, perhaps we go next to Mike, and then Paul, love to have you share your thoughts soon as well. Mike, please. Sure. I just can't express enough uh, enthusiasm for a lot of the ideas that uh, Andy's been sharing today and I've been reflecting. And one of the things that uh, really inspires me about Web3 and smart contracts and decentralized incentives is the great power for uh, non-coerciveness that they allow, that we can build these things that live you know, permanently on chain and they become these permanent structures that we can orient ourselves around in whatever way we decide to. It's not like a banking system comes in and says, you have to get an account this way and you have to provide your ID. So you have to go to the DMV and get your thumbprint scanned. Like there's not all this sort of uh, coercive structure around it. When we're building uh, a D app, when we're building a, a decentralized application of some kind, it becomes like this permanent structure in the environment. Uh, like as if a you know rural town in middle America suddenly had this big mountain like people would build ski lodges on it and there would be restaurants and people would go there to ski and let's have snowball fights. And there's this whole like economy would grow around this mountain that just appears out of nowhere. And with DApps, we can just kind of do that in cyberspace. We can build this permanent thing that does something and then stuff just kind of spontaneously forms around it according to the freedom of the people who care, according to the freedom of the people who it, who it reaches. And I just love how gentle that is, that when we build things, it's by the nature of those things that we uh, are enabled to, to react to them in, in new ways and form new institutions and social conventions in this way that's not imposed on us, but in a way that we're invited to participate on in. Uh, nobody really forced anyone to accept Bitcoin. There was no war in the Middle East to get people to trade oil for Bitcoin. It was just that by the properties of it, it attracted people who recognized the value. And I, I love the uh, ability that we have now to build such gentleness into the infrastructure that comes to replace our own. That's a beautiful point. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's interesting the word the enthusiasm comes from the Greek in theos. Uh, it means to see God in the world. 
but it's not a passive kind of sight. It really translated into English is to infuse one's vision of the divine into everything that one sees. Uh, and it is by precisely being enthusiastic and gentle. Uh, I think that the work that you're doing on idea markets and just your general approach to non-coerciveness in particular is one of the more thoughtful in the space. And I'm incredibly excited to see where you'll end up. Uh, it reminds me, I had mentioned uh, an ayah of the Quran earlier, and this reminds me of another, which is, it happens to be one of my favorites. Uh, there is something in the Quran called Ayat al-Karsi, which is the throne verse. And it's this massive high language declaration of uh, kind of the nature of God in some sense. But what comes immediately afterwards and is almost always ignored by people is a really beautiful verse. And it says, there is no compulsion in the deen, in, in the life transaction, uh, which is such an interesting word. It's not religion as it's often translated. It's just a life transaction. There's no compulsion in the deen. Truth stands out clearly from error. And I've really been reflecting on this a lot recently because it's not truth and falsehood as it's trying, it's truth and error almost as if in these sort of computing infrastructures, which are precedented on gentleness, on a non-coercion, truth does stand out from error, right? Like it, you, your transaction either succeeds or it errors, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and I've just kind of been pondering that and being like, huh, you know, like what is true is what passes our shared consensus fiction. Uh, and it stands out clearly from error because error leaves you with an ugly red stack trace true gives you logs, you know, <laughs> so it's, yeah, just, just a thought. There's always like some Greek word that Andy knows that I'm like, how do you come up with this? But it's wonderful. And it's a very particular thought on the Dean that I think is very meaningful. Um, Paul, I think we had thought you should earlier, please, please go ahead. Sure, yeah. Thanks, Vivek. So, so I guess I, I just want to start by saying that uh, I guess Kernel really has helped me find um, a lot of truth and meaning, I guess, in what I'm building um, before going into Web3. Um, I, I mostly got into it because I, I looked at NFTs and kind of saw that this was something that could disrupt systems. But um, just through these discussions, I with uh, and just listening to, to Andy Vivek, I kind of found, I guess, um, a, a direction on where I would want to take Web3 and what I'm building, and which is, I guess, very much aligned to what Andy is telling us about um, increasingly principled multiplayer games. And, um, and I guess I wanted to bring the discussion around how do we build those multiplayer games, those increasingly principled multiplayer games? Because, well, for, for, for example, what I find is as I build in the space that there's still the old systems that we lean on, right? For, for example, now um, we're thinking of building some NFT project. And if you want it to succeed, you still have to rely on the, I guess, on the old systems of marketing to the whales and then looking at these analytics to make sure it succeeds. So why I do feel that we're building a lot of these foundational systems that are changing, um, changing the system or changing the world, there's still this temptation to kind of lean into these old systems. Like, uh, I, like I still need to make money or something like that. But these developers still need to make money. So I, I just wonder how could we kind of not focus on those temptations, but rather really build something, something new, something more principled, something to really create these increasingly principled multiplayer games, as Andy would say? It's a really fantastic question. Uh, and I mean, for those of you who don't know, Paul is the writer of the entire game track. So not only has he perhaps got some meaning and uh, purpose from these talks. He has also added a whole bunch of his own. Uh, so don't let the humility distract you from uh, what has been an incredible contribution to the community so far. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, and I think that that speaks to like one of the ways in which I think about this. There's two things to say. The first is, you know, like one of the reasons this 
question is one of the reasons that I included the notion of elder games in the original syllabus, this game which is played after all of the possibilities of the original game as it was designed has been exhausted. Uh, you and I have discussed a little bit of what these elder games look like. There's one of like sort of gun collecting in, uh, in one of the worlds. I can't remember exactly which one it is uh, and various different ways of uh, like playing the game in a manner in which the designers had never really intended and yet gets its own economy and sort of vibrant community formed around it. Uh, and I think that, you know, sort of in combination with something like Arweave's adaptive incentive systems, there are ways practically of thinking about how can I design really open-ended games which incentivize the playing of elder games. Uh, because that allows for these kind of emergent uh, games within games and communities to form around them. Like if I build the game in like an open-ended enough way that like I still have the kind of uh, lack of contrivance and all of the things that Mark Ten Bosch and Jonathan Blow talk about that make a good game. And I have that like nugget of truth and clear mechanics and orthogonal, uh, you know, spaces of the mechanics. But within that also like add one more additional thing, which is like, how do I incentivize these kinds of elder games? Because that's precisely, you know, the, 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 the adaptive incentive stuff that Sam was talking about is exactly that. It's like, here is the game, it's this BitTorrent like system, but we're trying to figure out how like wildfire can be used to like get people to write their own uh, versions, which like inevitably results in these kind of pro-social feedback loops. Um, and the other question on a more personal, the other answer on a more personal level, right, is like, it, when one has to attend to the realities of this world, you, you need to support your family, pay rent, ensure a good standard of living, all of these things are genuine concerns and not to be ever like looked down upon or somehow dismissed because we have like a higher minded way of looking at the world or like an intentional approach or whatever. Like, in fact, these are the very constraints which allow intention <laughs> to blossom in creative and constructive ways. The thing is to develop a particular kind of discipline and skill about like what is enough, right? The question is not like, how can I make more money? It's how much do I really need, right? Uh, and if that's the case, like, then it's possible and that informs how you make open-ended games because all of a sudden you're not out to capture all of the value right you're out to make a valuable thing and sure like benefit from it there's no problem with that but i'm not looking to be the sole benefactor because i know that <laughs> you know through the things that i've learned and what i'm passionate about that uh, i <laughs> I never benefit in the long term, right? On a long enough timeline, everyone dies. So where is your wealth when that happens? <laughs> I really like that idea, Andy, of uh, when is enough enough, right? I see a lot of these projects like raising so much or making so much money, but it doesn't really, I guess, make it circular, I would say. So I guess it's a, it's a rethinking of how we're making these, these systems to not move everything up but try to to make it more equitable i would say mm. but yeah thank you yeah and it's also like like how do you think about this it's why i've started with mentioning like swimming today for instance right just in terms of speaking a little bit more about balance because like if wealth for me is just how much money this particular project nets and puts into my accounts then like I'll never really be able to answer that question of what is enough in a truly constructive or creative way, right? But if the work that I do allows me to spend more time with my partner, allows me to play with my kids more often, allows me to walk in the park like one more day a week and not have to sit, uh, you know, sort of struggling with some complicated and complex intellectual problem then that is a part of how I think about the wealth of my life. You know? And again, like the invitation is to consider that not just like what is enough, but like in a multi-dimensional way, right? Uh, like Douglas Rushkoff said in, in module four, you're like technology is not to just make more technology. It's to like at its core about giving us more time 
and more time for what? For to be with other human beings. <laughs> you know, like how can we within ourselves like shift more of this definitional question to like, you know, enough is how much time I get to spend with my best friend. How much, you know, yeah, these, these kinds of things also help in a practical sense with that question. Want to bring, yeah, Tegan, if she's willing, the thought was a bit back to compulsion, but happy, Tegan, to hear it from you, what you were thinking there. Yeah, um, I really just have a couple of stories that came to mind, really putting me in this present space, uh, mm -hmm. so I don't go completely abstract. Um, but Annie was talking about, you know, love in this infinite capacity for love. And uh, I had the lovely opportunity of talking to high school students this summer. And this morning, um, we had them just like share their favorite bar or line from a song. Um, and that led to a conversation about love. <laughs> Crazy. Um, and so I, was, I had a I asked them a question um, because we kind of got to a point of, you know, about heartbreak. Um, and said, you know, how does it feel? Because one student actually brought up, you know, this scientific aspect and how, you know, they get that, but they can't really relate to that. Um, it's like, yeah, think about, you know, there is this scientific process that's happening, but there's also this experience that we all have that we all are naturally able to love and be loved. And how does that make you feel? Uh, and it was really silent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, what Sita did like speak up and say how like that was really beautiful. Um, but I think in regards to compulsion, like that's really kind of a key. Um, and the second and last story I will share, I really don't have a comment. Um, yesterday I was at the park um, and I was coloring, um, which I'm not an artist. People keep telling me I'm an artist these days. It's, it's giving me hype. Um, but I was coloring and these these two little boys, it was probably eight. They literally walked past me was like, are you an artist? I was like, stop, <laughs> stop it right now, <laughs> please. I was like, um, not really. I mean, I do some stuff with NFTs and they just like kind of pass that by. They probably didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> And it was like, yeah, like that's so fine. Like they, they said my work was fine. Like that's how I know they really thought it was cool. Um, and I was like, they asked me what it was. I told them it was a map, but it was inspired by the seed of a boba flower. They was just like, yeah, that's cool. Probably had no idea what I was really saying, but, and then they just walked away. <laughs> just walked away. I, love I, I don't think they know like how much of a gift that was for me. Um, <laughs> and you talk about like seeing these limits, like that's something you can't really yeah. replace. Yeah. A moment in time you can't really remake. Yeah, yeah. Tegan, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know how many of y'all were here for the first virus I ever taking shared a poem. I, I have to kind of go back to one thing that is the last part of the module that we really haven't gotten back to yet, which was Duende. And it goes back to these ideas of poetry. And there's a quote in there that I think, I, I, I there's no way I could say it better than, than how Tegan just described it, but I'll try with just this quote. Um, the, for the purpose of the piece, when we talk about duende, which is a concept that I'll ask Andy to expand upon, poem, poet, poetry, these words don't matter as much as your own work, your own current identity and the particular state of awareness with which you can explore those, no matter if it's at a park or a random moment that you remember with, college, uh, with high school students or, or whatever those moments are, it's, it's about that intensity of awareness. And um, there's a part in the text, uh, it links to this idea of survival in two worlds at once. Um, there's the external world where you see the people, they see the things that you're working on, the art, that you're sharing, and then there's the internal world. Um, and I'll start to describe Duende, which, which is kind of the last piece that um, 
it's from a, a, a poet named Federico Garcia Lorca. Um, the concept of duende supposes that our poems are not things we create in order that a reader might be pleased or impressed or delighted or instructed. We write poems in order to engage in the perilous yet necessary struggle to inhabit ourselves, our real selves, the ones we barely recognize more completely. There's more to say there, but um, I'll go down to say, this struggle is not merely to write well-crafted and surprising poems, so much as to survive in two worlds at once. The world we see, the one made of people and weather and hard fact, that for all its wonders and disappointments has driven us to the page in the first place, and the world beyond or within that one, glimpse after glimpse that we attempt to decipher and confirm. Survival in the former is predicated on balance, perspective, rehearsal, breadth of knowledge. But for someone fully convinced of the duende, it's the latter world that matters more. The world where madness and abandon often trump reason and where skill is only useful to the extent that it adds courage and agility to your intuition. And Genuinely, Tegan, I mean, it means so much the things that you share today and so often during these firesides. It uh, so often is courageous and so often gets us more clearly to the point of what sometimes we can get more uh, philosophical about, but it's just more real sometimes when, when we hear from you, to be honest. So um, I wonder if Andy, you have anything to add on Duende or on any of those reflections? Just to echo what you say, that's, uh, it is a tendency, certainly of my own, to get more philosophical. And it's wonderful to have other voices and beautiful stories of children and parks and color. Let's add color to uh, whatever is happening here in Cape Town uh, and all over the world. You know, the first version of Kernel did not have this piece on Duende. Uh, it was just serenity and principles, uh, which is something that we also haven't really touched on today. This Brett Victor uh, video about uh, creators ought to have a direct and immediate connection to that which they create. And when he sees that not being the case, he doesn't see it as an opportunity. He sees it as a moral injustice and that he has a responsibility to fix it. He says that. You don't have to live this way, but the whole point of this talk is to tell you that you can. Uh, that there are ways of inventing on principle as part of a cultural battle that is const consistently underway. Uh, and in reflecting on Genesis block, I sort of noticed that this module without Duende can make it seem like it's possible to sort of sail through life in this supremely principled way, creating beautiful things that give us immediate connection to that which we're working on and allow us to live as these high-minded inventors focused on our own intentions. And that's not true. Uh, there is another aspect to this world which has to do with courage and intuition and what is so often hidden from our default consciousness, which becomes so apparent in moments like Tegan just described. You know, once um, Vivek and I had spent a lot of time hanging out uh, at DevCon in Prague, and we got away from the conference at one stage and uh, went up to the cathedral, it's a very, very beautiful place uh, overlooking the Vltava River and we were sitting outside this immense Gothic cathedral, uh, having a very particular conversation, which you may remember, uh, and feeling quite uh, connected perhaps with aspects, glimpses and glimmers of a different world. And I'll never really forget this little girl. She also couldn't have been more than six years old, Tegan. She ran up to us. She was playing with something and she sort of like dropped it, looked down at it, looked up at me, laughed her head off and picked up a thing and 
and, and ran away again. <laughs> and I was just shattered. Yeah, I mean, it was the most incredible moment because here I was kind of feeling fairly spiritual and having a deeply connected and connecting conversation with a very, very dear friend of mine. And this girl was just, I mean, completely, <laughs> completely absorbed in this. And, and the, the Spanish, you know, they talk about it as this duende. The prototypical story that Lorca tells about it is that there is a tango competition held, held in Spain one night in a cafe and all of these incredibly beautiful Spanish women get up in their 20s and their 30s, perfectly curved, wonderful dancers, immensely talented rhythm like you've never seen before. And they shake the cafe with their pirouettes and their particular kind of interpretation of this old and majestic dance and everybody is swooning and you know each new dancer adds something more and the night builds up builds up builds up until eventually this 80 year old woman completely plainly dressed stands up throws her arms above her head and stamps three times but she does it with such duende that there's no doubt the winner of this company is that this duende is not the muse it is not the angel it is something unique to spain and it has to do with death and struggle uh, it is captured in one of Locke's poems when he says it's a wonderful thing to know that glasses are for holding water but the terrible thing is not to know what thirst is for not to know what thirst is for thirst exists it is a reality it is dukkha it is the first of the noble truths. And the struggle is real for all of us in unique ways, which can be shared to some extent, but never completely communicated. And yet, when we give ourselves over to the duende, to the knowledge that we know all of this is passing and that we too will die, then something else can take the place of the temporary and transient self and express what is in ways which we cannot even begin to imagine. Uh, and so Duende is there because after Genesis Black and thinking that we kind of got a lid on this learned syllabus, I realized that we hadn't even begun to understand what's thirst is really for. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Andy. Um, I want to pass the mic to Leo, who has had his hand raised and is in Spain right now, perhaps to bring us home. Oh. We'll have um, only a minute or two left here until our time is up. I will put a gather time link in for anyone who wants to hang up after, but Leo, Leo please uh, take it away. Well, well, I'm very scared of no? talking about so many <laughs> intelligence things said. No, no, no. So many intelligent people. Uh, <laughs> kind of being the last. I was going to tell Andy in the in the in the Slack, like like like. I hope I can bring him to that cafe when uh, the other night I went walking and I was in one of the cafes that the uh, Garcia Lorca was there and in in Malaga. Uh, that is is, is, is is remembered for that and for some flamenco singers that were there uh, with him. No? Incredible, incredible art artist. Uh, I recommend everyone, a uh, poet in New York, that's my favorite from Garcia Lorca. It's like he, he lived in, in New York for some time and wrote a, an awesome uh, kind of uh, surrealistic poetry book about his impression from, like from from one world to another, from a very different world to another, very different world about about New York. Um, uh, what I was going to say, but I think yeah, perhaps it's a time. No, like I, all these ideas feel uh, beyond uh, beyond uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, uh, it feels like like we are talking really about changing the, 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 the way the human society has been organized for millennia, millennia. And, uh, and, and it feels like this is like a baby. I've had the impression that these, these ideas we're talking about, 
they are like a baby. They are going to outlast uh, a baby of ideas, and they are going to outlast um, uh, a blockchain. Uh, and 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 that make me, make me also think that like a baby, we're very being very 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 naive, you know? <laughs> very naive, and and we will see like how um, the perhaps like other forms of coercion and violence get created in a kind of uh, in a different world that uh, that this will create also no? like like but perhaps it will be better. I, hope, I think it will be much better. And we will have now, but we also we will have like yeah, uh, probably similar problems and just like like in, in other different way. That's what I was going to say, Regina, before <laughs> all this. Okay. Thank yeah. you, thank you. It's a yeah. profound insight. Uh, first, the recommendation on Lorca, and uh, then the point of these ideas are still in their infinite infancy and there is a lot of naivety to be uncovered, which is one of the reasons that Duende is included, right? The, in that piece, you'll see reference this notion that the cost of liberty is eternal vigilance, right? And what does eternal vigilance really mean? You know, what is that, what a burden it is uh, in some sense to uh, hone one's intensity to the single point of you know, hone one's awareness to the single point of intensity required to be present with all of the possibilities simultaneously, both those that are beneficial and those that are potentially less so. Uh, you know, it's it's not possible necessarily to say which way it goes. I have a another great friend who says that paradise is only real if it has a, a snag, <laughs> if it has a flaw, right? Uh, and And I I agree with that. I think that it's a beautiful way of seeing things and well balanced. That uh, certainly I am not in the sort of camp of utopians and thinking that you can build a perfect society. I think that Duende really matters. <laughs> I think that Duende is, I mean, having been in Spain and been to some uh, of these cafes, although I will definitely take you up on your offer, <laughs> um, there's something irreducible about struggle and about. Uh, the fight against, uh, you know, that is critical to, like, what it means to be a moral learning creature. You know, that if there's not that, uh, then our ability to exercise our morality and learn from our naivety and mistakes is gone. Right? Uh, and I can't imagine, yeah, that it would be an interesting world. When you said about the cost of levity, like brought my mind very suddenly, you know, the image of the gypsies, the image of the gypsies of Spain, and it's connected also with Lorca that wrote so much about the gypsies in Spain. And in that age, they, they used to be uh, nomads, you no, know? they are not anymore, but they used to be nomads and they have this levity in their life and that so much duende, you no, know? and like most of the flamenco people that have more duende are usually. Uh, of uh, gypsy heritage, but they also they have this cost of like kind of not being part of the mainstream society, you know, and 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 have to be kind of uh, really uh, like um, uh, escaping from the police and from the kind of the, the structure of the kind of mainstream uh, society. And... Thank you for sharing, Leo and. I wish we could continue on here, but I know people are slowly having to trickle out. Um, but it, it brings home, I think, the most important point, which is that if you're here now still and um, you think that we're mostly talking about blockchains, uh, it's not true. Um, our hope is that <laughs> um, that we, we can get together in spaces like the cafes that Leo is describing and explore many other parts of shared collective experience. Um, and we can have fun along the way. So I, I hope, like Mike, that there's a Cafe Kernel World Tour. We have ideas. And as we get from hundreds to thousands of people who have explored some of the same ground together, our hope is that it means that there's more hangouts and coffee shops and more shows that we get to go to together and more ways that we explore what living 
in this new Web3 way can mean for our own lived experiences and for the people around us. So if you do feel like sticking around, I'll put the link in the chat to Cafe Kernel. Um, it'll probably just kind of be a quiet hangout session. And it's very, very wonderful uh, to have all of you here. And I appreciate how much you all appreciate Andy. <laughs> I think it's something that always bugged me in the early days of being around the Web3 space was, uh, frankly, how few people uh, knew some of the ideas that he had been sharing, both technically and at this level. So um, it means a lot to have so many people around and exploring with us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Cafe Colonel, if anyone wants to keep it, keep it going. <laughs> Cheers. See you guys. Bye bye. Leo, you have some fun noises there. I'm going to check out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what's going over there. If anyone has any questions before we close out, just let me know. I'm going to be over here somewhere. See some party people. Let's I don't know. Alicia, I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>